we're in client services. We're trying to build a high performance firm. Three to four years ago, we get people giving two weeks notice. We think we have a good culture. And we're just like, this seems like a broken paradigm that people lie, interview, don't feel like they can discuss these things. And then we find out that they give two weeks notice. It's terrible for our clients. Like, How can we break this paradigm? This seems like a, a practice from the command and control era that, that no one's found a better way. And you know, the analogy that I like to use in this, we're, we're currently writing, our culture head and I are writing a book on mindful transition. We're almost done with it. Oh, cool. But, but our analogy is, can you imagine being in a relationship and the person says to you, hey, can you talk for a minute? Sure. What's up? Well... I, I'm, I'm moving. I have a new boyfriend and uh, I'll, I'm moving into his house in two weeks. And, and you said, I, I mean, you never even told me that you were unhappy. I, we would we would think that this is absurd, you know, Thank in a relationship. You. But this goes on every day. Welcome to the Talent Grow Show where you can get actionable, results-oriented insight and advice on how to take your leadership, communication, and people skills to the next level and become the kind of leader people want to follow. And now, your host and leadership development strategist, Haleli Azulai. Hey, talent growers. Welcome back to another episode of The Talent Grow Show. I'm Haleli Azulai, your leadership development strategist here at Talent Grow. And let's be real, a lot of times when people teach how to be a leader, how to create company culture, they don't necessarily have the experience of having done it. And some people who have the experience of building are not necessarily really great at breaking it down and teaching others how to emulate and replicate their success. So this week, we're lucky to have somebody who is both. We have Bob Glazer, and he has built successful companies, and he's good at sharing what makes them successful. So we're going to dig into the importance of culture and creating the right kind of culture. He has had a kind of culture that's created tons and tons of best place to work awards, including from Glassdoor, which is the list where the employees anonymously rank the company. So you can't rig that one. And he breaks it down. We also talk about how to know if somebody's not going to work out. And most controversially, Bob suggests you stop having a two-week notice policy, and he describes what to do instead. So I hope you'll enjoy this episode of the Talent Grow Show with Bob Glazer. Here we go. All right, talent growers, we have Robert Glazer, also known as Bob. He's the founder and CEO of global performance marketing agency, Acceleration Partners. He's also the co-founder and chairman of Brand Cycle. In addition to being a serial entrepreneur, Robert has a passion for helping individuals and organizations build their capacity to outperform. Under his leadership, Acceleration Partners has received numerous company culture awards, including number four on Glassdoor's Employees Choice Awards. Well, we're going to talk more about that. Ad Age's Best Place to Work, Entrepreneur's Top Company Culture, Inc. Magazine's Best Place to Work, Great Place to Work, and Fortune's Best Small and Medium Workplaces, and Boston Globe's Top Workplaces. And I am sure as we speak, they're racking up more of these awards. He's a past recipient of Boston Business Journal's 40 Under 40 Award, and he recently authored the international best-selling book, Performance Partnerships, The Checkered Past, Shifting Present, and Exciting Future of Affiliate Marketing. Bob, welcome to the Talent Grow Show. Thanks, Halali. I'm excited to be here. I'm really glad that you're here. And listeners, as you could tell from all of those awards, I was like, we want to find out what makes a company culture the kind of company culture that gets all of these awards. Before we go there, I always ask my guests to describe their professional journey briefly. Where did you start and how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, I started, I guess, going downward in size from organizations. But I, after school, I started in strategy consulting, kind of, I graduated right in the dot com. What did you Ooh. study? I studied business. I actually created a, an independent major that was half business and half organizational psychology. I think I had an inkling that I wanted to work with small businesses. And I can tell you the psychology gets used a lot more than some of the business fundamentals. Uh, went on to work in a venture capital fund and really was always focused on growth and settled into a business growth set into the sort of customer acquisition side, which was where I really liked to operate under the premise that I think 
there are a lot of great consumer businesses out there. But if you don't have a way to find customers cost effectively, then you really don't have a, a sustainable business. Right. So you went into the venture capital, then you went into customer acquisition. Continue. Yeah. Then I then I went and operated in a business for three or four years, worked with the founders, grew that business, and really decided I was increasingly becoming unemployable and helping helping other people grow their business while working in the business uh, didn't feel very rewarding. And I ended up leaving and starting two businesses at the time. One was sort of in the affiliate marketing space and one was Acceleration Partners, even though we were doing a little more different stuff at, at that time and really made my own business helping other people grow their businesses. And on the side, you started a newsletter. Yeah. So... Three years ago, I started just sending a note every Friday as I worked on my morning routine and, and, and tried to get more intentional called Friday Inspiration. And I sent it to the 40 or 50 people that were on my team every Friday. And it was a quote and a story or something that I had found that I really liked. And I pulled it together and it, it, was, it was even helpful for me. And I really didn't think anyone was reading these things or I, I didn't know if they were paying attention. And then I would start getting emails back saying, you know, I really love these. I look forward every Friday. I send it to my mom. I send it to my sister. Mm -hmm. My husband forwarded it to his company. And I started talking to a few other CEOs about it. I said, you know, I'm getting... I've been doing this and I've been getting really great feedback. I'll send you mine. You can forward it along or you can try it. And I was literally BCCing people at the time. And then a few more people asked me about it. And I decided to start uh, a newsletter. I kept it like a plain format, but I just couldn't manage the emails. And then I, it just started getting forwarded around. And I set up a website to put the old ones on that people were asking about. And to you know, three years later, it's about 40,000 people around the world, I think in 50 countries each week to get Friday forward. And it's ended up turning into the, the sort of genesis for my second book. It's amazing. Yeah. And I, you know, one of the things uh, listeners know is I, I love to hear stories about people who are building something in addition to their, like their main job, you know, the focus of their job, your, your job was not focused on writing a book or writing a, a newsletter. It was something that you did kind of as a passion project. And now you're doing two tracks at the same time, right? You're speaking on podcasts, you're speaking at conferences, but you're also running businesses. Yeah. And they reinforce each other. I, I think the when you're clear about your values and you make decisions to do things that are values aligned, even if you don't know how they logically you know, complement what you do, there's always a positive outcome on that because it's the stuff you like to do and is easy to do and, and brings you energy. And, and really, the more you're doing of that, I, I could never have imagined a lot of the opportunities that would have come out of just starting that that email. I just, when I started getting busy and I made the decision, I said, I like this and it's helping people. So I'm going to do it. I'll figure out how and if it makes money later on. Very cool. All right. So now we're going to go to where I know people are just clamoring to hear. Yeah, Glassdoor, I guess maybe some listeners might not know. Glassdoor is, and this is my interpretation of it, maybe I'm wrong too. It's a website where employees anonymously rank their current or past employers and give reviews to help other people. Like if I'm looking for a job, I can look in there to kind of get the, the dirt, you know, like to get the real story about this organization and what it's like to work there. So for you to have a high ranking and to place number four on Glassdoor's Employees' Choice Awards means that people that work for you currently and in the past say, this is a place to work. How do you get such a reputation? Like what are some of the secrets that you can share with us on how you've built such a culture? Yeah. And let me start by saying that, I, you know, there are some, you can make some different cases about what a good culture or a bad culture is. I think there's some objective things where you could say that this is really bad and, and this is really good. But, but my definition of a good culture is just one that is consistent between what it thinks, what it says, and, and how people act. And, and I think the frustration and the dissatisfaction that people have in most companies is that inconsistency mm. with, with what is on the wall, with how the leaders act, and all that stuff. So what we have done is just clearly identify what is important to us, where, where we're going as a business, what our values are. We found people who believe in that. And then that is exactly how people are expected to act. It's how they're hired. It's how they're promoted. It's how they're managed out if they're not working. Our core values are used literally daily. They're used in our awards, all that stuff. So it's just really consistent. So if you're a type of person that signs up for what we have on the wall or what we market, you're going to come in and that's exactly what the company values. Now, you may realize when you get here that you're actually 
you like those values, but they're not you and it might not work for you. But I think that is different than someone saying, God, those guys were full of bleep. You know, they, mm. they said one thing, it was on the wall, these core values, no one acted like that. Uh, you know, they, I, I, I like to include the Patty McCord slide on Enron, you know, their values were like trust, integrity, and respect. And that's just not how you got promoted at, at Enron. So I, I think what we're really focused on, it's a lot of Patrick Lencioni around consistency and clarity is that we just, we do what we say and we say what we do. I, I don't believe it's for everyone. We have some very specific things. We have a remote workforce, people work from home. It's definitely not for everyone, but it is a great culture for, for the right people and the people that have opted in and self-identified for that. So it sounds like this is the definition of integrity, right? Doing what you said you'll do. Yeah. And, and I will tell you, because I do the onboarding, this is how much you know important I do the cultural onboarding for really? every new employee wow. within their first two weeks of work. We, do, we go through an hour thing together in some small groups. And I asked them about past companies and how it's different or the same. And it is, you are better off not having core values. Or <laughs> You have a culture by default or by design. You're better off not having core values than having these things on the wall that no one ever talks about or does anything with. And in terms of talking to employees that have come here and said, they just don't trust management or leadership when the stuff's painted everywhere and literally no one behaves or acts in that way. Yeah. It kind of just smacks you in the face. You know, the, the duplicity of it is spelled out. It's worse than not having anything. Yeah. I, I, I really, I, I believe that. So core values can either be a joke or they can really be things that you say, look, if I wasn't around and you had an emergency, one of our three core values should be the answer to whatever problem that you need solved. Like those, those are real core values. And so, okay, it sounds like definitely you're spending time enculturating people into the organization and teaching them about the values. Do you also give them examples of how to enact on them? Yeah, I mean, we talk about it a lot. I mean, one of the things that we do on our bi-weekly all company call is that we people send in examples. So, so we have a kind of core value shout out section. So Sarah demonstrated Excel and Improve this week when she did... X or Melissa demonstrated embracing relationships and, and people send us the story. So we're, we're always highlighting it, but, but half, maybe three quarters of the battle is that we, we, we find people that have these values. Uh, it's a big part of our, our interview process is really focused on aptitude and focus on values. I, I think you can always get better around our values and we give people examples. Here's how you could be better at embracing relationships or here's how you could have owned this better. But fundamentally, they have to be that type of person or not be that type of person. I was just coaching a nonprofit that I work with yesterday that's kind of struggling to sort out core values. And I think a lot of people confuse external and internal. I, my definition of core values is, is the DNA makeup of a successful person at the organization. It's not what we send to clients. It's not our product or service. I think it's very hard to mix those things. They tend to be, tend to be different things. So because we, we consider those the DNA of the person who's successful at Acceleration Partners, a big part of our interview process is testing for, for those values. You've said that there are really three reasons why somebody's not going to work out at your company. And you say that the first two are pretty black and white. So tell us, what are those three things? It sounds like you're describing one of them. And how can leaders make better decisions about fit when they're struggling with this? Yeah. So I think there's three, there's three reasons that people won't work out at any company. And, and one of the things that we're really big on, and, and I know we'll get into this a little bit later, is there are always going to be problems. I think a lot of companies treat the symptoms of problems and, and say, oh, this person's not working. And we get into the why and which part of it. And, and, really because, and we have decision trees so that we can really make kind of clear decision to understand what we're dealing with. So when I say that, I think you might have issues that are derivations of this, but it comes down to three things. The first is the person's just not a fit for your company. They are not the right person. They are not the right attitude. No matter any, if anything about the job, irrespective, they're a bad culture fit and you should exit that person. The second case where, where you're having a, an issue would be when the person completely understands what is expected of them and, and just can't meet it. They can't meet the performance goals and they know they're not meeting it. So, so I'll give you two examples. Let's say that, you know, from our world in sales, the person was hired, they knew that, you know, the quota was a million dollars for the year and they put up $400,000 the first year and $400,000 second year. So that's just, it's just pretty black and white, right? They, yeah. they, they, they can't do what they know that they should do. And they say, I get the quota. I just can't make it. Client service, it could be their job is about retaining clients happy and that person has had 50% of their clients turnover over the two years. So that becomes a really clear performance discussion around, you know what we need done. 
the the problem I think from, from most companies, and this does get to number one too, if they're not clear about their core values, if you're super clear about your core values and someone doesn't fit it, they will actually opt out 90% of the time before you start a discussion with them. So that that solves that. So the third bucket is you aren't, clear. Uh, so no one, no one, and I see this a lot. Someone hires a sales and marketing person and the people in marketing thought they were going to market and the people in sales. So they actually think they're doing the right things and people in the company think they're doing the wrong things. And these are the ones where all this ambiguity gets in the way and everyone's frustrated because the person thinks they're doing a great job. Other people think they're not doing a great job because the objective metrics have, have not been set. So I really think the goal is for companies, and, and those are messy, those, that third bucket, is, is mm. to be clear enough to get everything into the first or second bucket. So like, look, the person's not the right person or this, the performance doesn't work, but we've been super clear about expectations. So when we post a job, a job has a six, to, and it has the five core responsibilities that will be on the person's basically performance review and has a list of KPIs at six months and a list of KPIs at 12 months. And so we tell people is when we're sitting down at six and 12 months, whether this is your successful or not, it, it, these are the metrics, these are the outcomes. So there's no one deciding after the fact, oh, we thought they were doing more sales. We thought they were doing more marketing. And that just really eliminates a lot of that third bucket so that we're really talking about objective measures of, of performance and not totally different expectations between the employee and the employer. Yeah. Which makes it, you know, a lot of times people complain and feel like they've been treated unfairly because it seems like it's subjective, you know, like you're, right. applying, you're applying some metrics to me after the fact, never having told me about them or told me something else. Well, yeah. And when exactly, we use what's called a 555 system. It comes from uh, the entrepreneurial operating system and the book Traction. Mm -hmm. So when you have your first check-in, it will literally go something like this. It will say, hey, Brad, we're going to go over how you did on the company's core values in the last quarter. We're actually going to rank you against core values. How you did on the three or four things you committed at the beginning of the quarter to get done. And how are you on the five core responsibilities, like the stuff that you would have seen on your job description in terms of the the KPIs. And, and so that all was known, right? You, you know the score. Are you living the values? Did you do what you said you were going to do 90 days ago? We really operate on a quarterly rhythm. And did you hit those metrics that we had basically put on the jobs back you know, before you came here that we said we were going to look at at, at six months? So by removing those surprises, a lot of these things take care of themselves. I think people don't want to like you said, the distrust is when it's kind of a, a moving target. People don't want to do a poor job. If they sense that they're not a fit for core values or a salesperson who knows they have a quota of a million dollars, and so easy in sales, this is, we're trying to bring this clarity to other roles, but they know that they have a quota of a million dollars and they're on track for $400,000, that salesperson's probably looking for a new job. Mm -hmm. before you even have to have a discussion with them. Yeah, it does really help. The more clear and objective you can make the goals and the strategies, the more that people can track how they're doing. So you mentioned quarterly and that you have a quarterly focus and you do the 555 quarterly. Do your managers and leaders have other conversations about performance along the way before the quarterly or is that the first time they're talking about it? No, so we, we have part of our, our core value of Excel and Improve is that improvement is really about feedback. So we have a very real-time live culture of feedback. We actually encourage people not to sit on feedback. Like feedback yes. at, at the quarterly should not be, I'm saving a grievance of something you did 60 days ago. Yes, yes. And, and, and it, the, feed, the, the check-in section is sort of a general, we're, we're recalibrating, how are we doing? Let's look at this. But feedback should be given in real time. And we, and we everyone and all the leaders have read Kim Scott's Radical Candor and really focused on you know, delivering outcome-based feedback in real time. So if you don't know how to give or take feedback, you won't do very well at our company. Awesome. So you guide people to give in real time the feedback and you give them the tools, but with a book, you said, and then the expectation is that the quarterly meetings are really just a summary. Yeah, it's not even a summary. I, it, it, it's sort of a recalibration. How are you yeah. doing overall? And, and hey, there were a couple of these issues. So should we talk about this? But but there's no saving up of... You know, I, I saw a presentation by the Ritz-Carlton. They called it targeting. Like You shouldn't be saving up all your grievances to the quarter and be like, you were pissed I did this 90 days ago? Like what, <laughs> why, why the hell are you telling me that now? Exactly. Oh, it's one of the things I harp on a lot in my talks and workshops. So I'm glad to hear that we're in alignment. You also had a really interesting blog I read. You wrote about 
how to put an end to the two weeks notice practice. And you say that there is something better that you call open transitions where employees and employers become partners in finding the best possible solution, creating a healthier work environment, reducing anxiety and allowing for effective planning. So both parties can seize new opportunities. So this was, uh, I was quoting from you. So uh, your company, you're calling that mindful transition program. Tell us about that. We're in client services. We're trying to build a high performance firm. Three to four years ago, we get people giving two weeks notice. We think we have a good culture. And we're just like, this seems like a broken paradigm that people lie, interview, don't feel like they can discuss these things. And then we find out that they give two weeks notice. It's terrible for our clients. Like, how can we break this paradigm? This seems like a, a practice from the command and control era that, that no one's found a better way. And, you know, the analogy that I like to use in this, we're, we're currently writing, our culture and I are writing a book on mindful transition. We're almost done with it. Oh, cool. But, but our analogy is, can you imagine being in a relationship and the person says to you, hey, can you talk for a minute? Sure. What's up? Well, I, I'm, I'm moving. I have a new boyfriend and uh, I'll, I'm moving into his house in two weeks. And, and you said, I, I mean, you never even told me that you were unhappy. I, we would we would think that this is absurd, you know, Thank in a relationship. You. But this goes on every day. It took us a while. People didn't believe us. We said, we're really going to change this. We want to change this paradigm. If you're not happy, tell us. And, and likewise, if we're seeing problems, we're going to tell you. And if you come to us and you and you talk about a problem or we get down to the root we look at anything that's not working as a chance to kind of dig a little deeper and say, what, what's going on here? Is this a fixable problem, an unfixable problem? How do we address this before you're interviewing? Because by the time you're interviewing, we, we, we've lost you. And we said, look, we will never walk you to the door if you come and have these discussions. And these go both ways. There are people come to us and, and started them. We've started them with people. We will let people work here for two to three months. We know they're leaving. We know they're interviewing. They're on sort of a transition plan. And we've done this openly and, and people don't even know who's who. We treat everyone the same respectfully. We found great jobs for other people. Sometimes it's like, hey, the job that you want, we don't have. But why don't you start looking? We'll use our Rolodex. We actually, one person on our team, we knew what he wanted to do through discussions. And we knew we just didn't have the right role for him. And, a, and an opportunity came up at a great company in the industry. He could double his income, move, like dream job. We went to him with it. He took it. And now we're working with that company years later. So we're just trying to have positive outcomes. We're trying to remove the stigma around leaving. The data says, if you look at Facebook and Google, you know, the best places to work, that people last like 1.5, 1.8 years. Data is pretty clear that, that people aren't going to last forever. So rather than getting all upset when people want to leave, we're trying to up the emotional intelligence, have people have open conversations, figuring out a good landing place. And we have a a really great group of alumni that that are advocates for us. That's really cool. Are you familiar with the book, The Alliance? Uh, I think I've heard of it, but I'm yeah. not. Reed Hoffman, with... uh, oh, you know, yeah. LinkedIn founder, Reed Hoffman with Ben Casnocha and Chris Ye. And they describe the employer relationship that they're saying it's changed. We need to just get with the program and talk about it more openly and stop the charade of pretending that, you know, we're back in the industrial age where you joined a company until you got the gold watch at the end of your whatever, you know, 50 year career with them. It's not going to happen, as you said. So why are we pretending that we're going to stay f together forever? And how about if we just talk about it as like, hey, I, we're we're both on a temporary thing together, we're calling it a um, tour of duty instead of, an, yeah. you know, the employment and the employee relationship is kind of like a project, you know, we're always just getting together and they might stick around for the next project and the next project with your company or might not. And, and being more honest about it just helps to free everybody else. But we know that the stigma exists because many cultures are not doing that, are not being upfront. And to be fair, a lot of companies, I always say like the employees really need to own it and have the discussion. A lot of reason why they don't have it at discussions is because if they had that discussion at their company, the employer would tell them to leave. So we Exactly. Or they would retaliate against them or treat <laughs> right. them differently for the time that they're still there. Yeah. And, and I think it's such a short-sighted thing. And so basically, we spent two or three years, we built a system and a program around this. We started training. People started asking us, how do you do this? And we couldn't, I couldn't really send them what we had. So, so my head of culture and myself sat down and uh, like I said, we, we, we've written an entire book on what is this? How do you do it? And the real goal there is, is to break the two weeks notice paradigm. We think this is, uh, I agree with the readers from it's, it's a relic from a, from a different era. We want to see companies change their behavior. So when that comes out, I think it will give companies or 
you know, people within organizations to a, a playbook to say, you, it doesn't have to be the whole company. As a leader, you could say, look, this is how I'm going to run my team. Mm-hmm. Like I'm going to create honesty and transparency and my team, people on my team are going to go on and work at other places. I want to know about it. But, you know, we just had a whole discussion yesterday around, you know, someone was asking us about internal transfers and like, look, if you don't, if you don't let people even transfer internally or, or you won't have open discussions where they feel comfortable with you about that, then they're just going to leave the company uh, overall and, and, and not tell you. So yeah. yeah, we don't really get two weeks notice from people. The problems that end up with these things turning negative or toxic are because people don't address them or, or push them under the rug. I think we just have this culture of, hey, what's going on? There seems to be an issue here. Let's talk about it. And we have these frameworks, like I, like I talked about before. I mean, we have decision trees. Is this a cultural issue? Is this, you're looking to do something, oh, you want to do something different, great. Well, do we have that role or do we not have that role? Okay, if we have that role or we're going to have that role, here's what we'll do to move you into that role. If we don't have that role, then we're going to have an honest discussion and say, you kind of identified you want to do something different. We don't have that role. We should probably help you find that role somewhere else. So, so we really try to turn it into a science and give managers a playbook on how to on how to work with us. I love it because you're right. When people feel like it's going to be a career hindering move to say what's really going on and they're starting to lie and cheat. Really, they're cheating on you when they're looking for yeah. another job. And so your whole relationship changes to one of deceit. And I don't think employees realize I'm a big fan of Dan Pink and mm-hmm. the books he's written. And his latest book, When, talks about timing. Yes. And he talks about endings and how the end changes your whole memory of, of the experience, why you should plan your last best day of vacation of your vacation the last day or two, because it will it will sort of burn the memory of your whole vacation. There's a lot of people that have done great work for a bunch of years and then how they leave will forever change that memory for the people that they they worked around. And, and so ending well is really important. And I think this whole two weeks notice paradigm, it just is not ending well. Like I said, let's say we work together for five years. You come to me and you say, I loved working for you, but I'm leaving. And uh, you know, maybe it's two weeks, maybe it's three weeks or whatever. And then I start saying, well, I, hey, yeah, you never talked to me. And Oh, that doctor's appointment wasn't. You've been interviewing for like uh-huh. I, yeah, I, I, I just my whole memory of your time here changes. Yes. Oh, and listen, it was definitely if you remember, Dan Pink was on episode eighty three, and he talked about this book when. So go check that out. This is so good and so important. So thank you for doing that kind of work, and also thank you for working out loud. In other words, you're not just doing it on the inside of your company, but you're sharing it with the world. That is. Really cool. Um, so we're almost out of time. Before you share one specific action with listeners, and we'll talk about how to stay in touch with you. What's new and exciting on your horizon? What project or discovery has your attention these days? Uh, I'm finishing my second book, so that's that's got my attention. It's a lot and, of work. Yeah, and we're also expanding to Asia, and and I just launched an office in Singapore. Wow. Uh, so so we've been ramping up our our team over there. I'm headed over there in a few weeks, and a lot of new experiences. I'm, you know, we expanded in the UK last. Last year, but but Asia, just the time, the culture, it's, it's different. So it, it's really interesting to try to build a company and take our culture and figure out how to globalize it and localize it. This is so, so interesting. You know, uh, Bob, I, I record my podcast. A lot of times I batch them. So I was just recording an episode that probably will also come out before yours with a man who ran Saxo Bank for 20 years. He's Danish. The Saxo Bank is a Danish company, but people work there from all over the world. And we were talking about values and the ethnic culture and how to kind of merge the two or how to deal with that when your organization's culture is maybe in some ways different than the local culture. Yeah, it's I I think that I try to learn from other people's failures <laughs> before yeah. I make them myself. And I'm talking to a lot of companies that expanded, they, they seem to make one of two fatal flaws. One is they take, let's pretend just we're going from the US to the UK. They, they launch in London by taking all their US teams, sending them over. They don't understand the market. They don't understand the differences. They know the company, but they kind of make a mess of the market. So mm-hmm. that's, that's one. Two is they hire the local person out of the UK leave them to run their stuff, don't really explain the culture, and it ends up being this siloed business that is almost a, a totally different business. Right. So, so we've really worked hard to try to 
you know, talking to people to cover the in-between. We have a lot of talent going back and forth, learning from each other, really making sure that we respect those local differences and find people that are experts in the market. But understand, we also have a single way of doing things as a company and we have cultural norms that need to be consistent throughout the organization. And it's been a challenge that I've actually enjoyed trying to, to make that work. Yeah, a very interesting challenge. Sounds exciting and congratulations on your success. So Bob, what's one specific action that our listeners can take today, this week, that can help them upgrade their own leadership skills? Read. Um, I, I, yeah. I, read, I read a ton. We, we, we actually just bought Kindles for all of our um, uh, executive leadership team and picked a book as a, each quarter that we're reading as a team. Whether it's reading, podcasts, I, I just think there's always opportunities to improve your intellectual capacity and get smarter and figure out how, how to do things in different ways. And a lot of people have, have studied one aspect of something for 10 years and you can read that in a few hours and get the, the, the best of that. So um, yeah, I'm a big fan of just reading and continuous learning. Very cool. And do you have a particular philosophy about what you read or how you choose what to read? If I hear it two or three times, usually, so mm-hmm. I, you know, I look, I look around my my circles. I'm I'm about ninety eight percent nonfiction uh, in in my reading. I, I like learning. I like pragmatic. For me, reading sort of a learning thing more than a a, a distraction thing. But I, I look for what's new, what's coming out, things that help explain something that a topic that I'm interested in. So I, it usually for me is that I buy about ten books for every two I read. I have massive, and I read a lot. So it's just. I, the, everything interests me, but it, when I hear it the first time, then I hear it the second time, by the time a third person in my network mentions a book to me, that, then I know it's, it's, it's meant to be. Gotcha. Cool. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. So uh, Bob, how can people stay in touch, learn more from you and about you? Sure. Best way, you can go to Robert Glazer, G-L-A-Z-E-R.com to find out everything about me, all the different links to the stuff I do. Uh, if you're interested in joining the Friday Forward list and start getting a, a little note you could for yourself or share with your team each Friday that'll make you think, that's at FridayFWD.com. Very good. Well, thank you for your time today. We appreciate that you came on the Talent Grow Show and shared your insights with the listeners. Thanks, Aleli. So there you have it. You need to keep learning. And so listening to this podcast is a way that you're doing that. So kudos to you. And are you a reader? Do you read? What are you reading? Share with us. Come on into the show notes page on talentgrow.com and share in the comments any big takeaways that you've got from this episode and or any books that you'd like to recommend to other listeners. We'd love to have a conversation and I'd love for you to also share your knowledge and your learning with us. So thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I am Halalia Zulai, your leadership development strategist here at Talent Grow. And this has been the Talent Grow Show. And until the next time, make today great. Thanks for listening to the Talent Grow Show, where we help you develop your talent to become the kind of leader that people want to follow. For more information, visit talentgrow.com.